Hi guys, today I will talk about alliances and collaboration. Very interesting topic in the field of international business and uh, strategic management in general. Um, on the picture, uh, do you see um, a hotel uh, from uh, the Kempinski brand line? Um, and it's an example of how a medium-sized business with the number of uh, number of uh, hotels around the world has decided to join a larger alliance of uh, like-minded players um, in uh, what is called the Global Hotel Alliance that, that joins, um, that joins uh, various uh, kind of boutique uh, upscale uh, hotel uh, brands um, and chains in a larger group that benefits all its members uh, and helps them compete with larger players such as Marriott. Um, so in this talk, um, I'll look into different types of alliances, uh, some of them involving uh, financial investment, equity alliances, some of them more contractual. Uh, we'll look at you know, the, the whole life cycle of alliances from formation to evolution uh, and uh, finally impact uh, of uh, um, alliances on corporate uh, performance. Um, so let's first start with defining alliances. Uh, there's different views on this, but you could say that this is a, a voluntary agreement among various market players. Um, and it's not uh, a purely market contractual, uh, purely market transaction, such as uh, uh, exports, um, a sale of goods, a supplier uh, customer relationship. Uh, and it's also not on the other uh, hand, uh, uh, a merger and acquisition uh, where one company is bought by another or merges with another. So it's somewhere in between. Um, some authors include joint ventures under uh, this umbrella, um, um, others um, uh, don't. So it, it, it can be uh, dependent on uh, who you talk to. Now, if you think about who do companies uh, form alliances with, um, First thing that comes to mind and traditionally in the research on alliances, there was stress on competitors as uh, somebody that you don't have to just see as a foe, but you can see as kind of a friend and, you know, uh, uh, join forces, uh, ally uh, with somebody rather than just compete with them. Um, but uh, more recently, uh, the stress on other types of partners. Um, so if you think about it, um, your um, suppliers, could be your alliance partner, your customers could be a, um, uh, an ally. Um, you could think about um, a kind of groups of organizations, uh, clusters or business associations with whom you can cooperate, a firm from other industries, so not competitors, but uh, kind of uh, complementers from other industries. So this is quite a broad gamut of partners for alliance strategy. Academia uh, could be also a, an alliance partner. Uh, now, alliances have uh, the pros and cons, uh, the advantages and disadvantages. So obviously, I think companies do um, aim for some synergy. So that's the complementary assets. Uh, by joining forces, they also reduce uh, costs uh, by sharing those development costs, for example, uh, risks and uncertainties by uh, choosing a partner for entering a foreign market in particular. Um, There's an opportunity to learn, so that links to complementary assets, but also kind of a more dynamic perspective on not just uh, accessing the assets, but, but continued learning. Um, and that time perspective links to the possibility to use alliances as real options, meaning they, uh, they give you an option to, um, to um, up your investment and say after entering a country with a joint venture, uh, you get to know the partner, get to know the market, and uh, this gives you an option to say acquire the partner or, or um, increase your investment in the country. On the other hand, there's this potential risks, uh, as in um, most business situations, you can choose a wrong partner. Uh, it could be quite clumsy in terms of coordinating the relationship, even getting to the deal, the negotiation is costly. Uh, there's potential for partner opportunism, um, uh, means cheating uh, by partners or just not really sticking to the agreement. Uh, and you know, the opposite of learning from partners is partner learning from you uh, too much and perhaps becoming a competitor. Um, an example of uh, 
kind of an alliance going sour uh, is the French food producer Danone um, that um, uh, had a number of joint ventures with a Chinese company, Baha. Um, and uh, it was initially quite successful, perceived to be successful, but later the, the partners got into, uh, into quarrels uh, about some of the uh, potentially uh, financial issues being uh, camouflaged by Baha. On the other hand, the Chinese partner was accusing Danone of not committing enough to the venture. Um, uh, or to the joint ventures and uh, eventually the companies ended up in a lawsuit, kind of a divorce, <laughs> and uh, that was dragging for years and years, uh, even six years after the, uh, uh, the initial disagreement, uh, um, the norm was quoting this as one of major headaches for them in uh, the international operations. Um, so these were equity joint ventures where uh, say Danone invested particular share in, in particular legal entities that, that uh, uh, operated uh, um, under kind of uh, um, investment of both of the partners uh, but some of the alliances do involve just a contract so they don't involve having a legal entity with say 50 50 percent uh, share of ownership or i don't know 30 70 percent uh, share of ownership so quite a lot of uh, alliances uh, are contractual uh, it could be co-marketing r d contracts turnkey projects uh, licensing franchising strategic uh, supply uh, agreements um, and the equity ones are not just joint ventures, but for example, could be strategic investment. Uh, Singapore Airlines, for example, had a stake in uh, Air New Zealand. Um, cross shareholding, sometimes it's not just one company having a stake in the other, but uh, the other way around as well. Uh, so cross uh, shareholding, um, quite common in the, in the airline industry as well. Um, so these are kind of the two options and they are a compromise between market transaction and mergers and acquisition. In terms of partner selection, as I think there's two factors uh, companies need to consider, it's partner competence and partner comfort. Uh, obviously you're looking for a partner that's uh, both competent and with which you uh, have a good comfort. It seems obvious, but uh, you know, as uh, in life, if I would be thinking, say, about my daughter choosing her partner, uh, you could find a partner that really has a lot of resources, a lot of competence, really, uh, you know, solid competence as a partner, but you have really poor comfort. So while it is uh, kind of a no-brainer that you're looking for a partner that is uh, really competent and with whom you can work uh, well in terms of relationship, uh, you can't always get both of those things and that results in unstable, um, unstable uh, alliances. But over time, I think both partner competence and comfort can increase. So you can you know, learn to become more comfortable with each other uh, and also competence of the partner can, uh, can improve. Uh, the overall uh, result of a successful uh, partnership or alliance is, is good performance. So there's a number of issues, uh, equity kind of you know, investment, but also how equitable um, uh, the split between, um, between the alliance partners uh, is, that affects performance, uh, nationality, whether there's any cultural clashes um, um, in between the partners, uh, relational capabilities, how you handle the differences and problems, and then how much you can learn and how you manage that learning process and experience. Sometimes the experience is also what you had before. So companies with a lot of, uh, a lot of previous experience in alliances are better at uh, managing them in the future. So to wrap up, um, uh, performance is the ultimate goal of strategic alliances, but it's also important to distinguish between kind of the two levels. So you could look at performance at the um, the actual alliance or joint venture level, network level, and then the parent firm level. Um, and uh, you need to be aware of the fact that, uh, uh, you know, there's not just objective kind of hard number uh, based uh, measures of performance, but also subjective ones such as uh, the management satisfaction uh, in uh, the joint venture or if there's a, a goal that's non-financial, it's, it's more strategic, what's the assessment of that goal? But obviously objective uh, measures of performance such as financial performance, innovation performance, um, uh, market share, um, 
and say for the parent from stock market uh, performance and reaction um, would be quite important. As for the alliance level, you could also look at you know the stability and longevity, which might not be something that parent firm might necessarily think it's that important as long as, as the joint venture or alliance contributes to the strategic goal. Um, quite often, uh, these are not meant to be forever, so they're not necessarily marriages. Uh, it's not like a merger where uh, you've really invested everything into, into pulling forces together. This could be often uh, somewhat temporary uh, agreements or even, you know, the equity ones joint ventures could could be meant to be there for a certain time. So the, the longevity is not necessarily always the, the right measure of performance, uh, at least not from the parent firm level. And um, so if you're interested in learning more about these topics, uh, uh, they are covered uh, in more depth uh, for free in my international business and global strategy uh, textbook available on bookboom.com. Um, there's uh, some good coverage of, of these topics in the global strategy uh, text uh, published on tophead.com. Um, and there's really good chapter on um, on uh, alliances and, uh, and joint ventures and related strategic issues in the context of Asia Pacific and the Cambridge University Press text, uh, uh, Contemporary International Business in the Asia Pacific region uh, that I co-authored. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this talk and uh, um, you can also check out my other videos. Thank you.